I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't have too many comments uh, for the meeting. Uh, we do have a new member. Uh, John, are you going to talk about Dr. I, Krasavich? I can. Okay. Dr. Krasavich is with us, and he was on the uh, governing council at one time, and John will talk about him. We have a new state's attorney, and would you introduce yourself, please? Kevin Myers. I'm just filling in for Keith for the uh, for the day he ran late on a hearing, so it'll still be Keith from now, uh, from now on. Okay. Thank you very much, and welcome to our meeting. And John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, as John mentioned, we have our uh, final and 12th member of the board that was officially appointed by the county board last month, Dr. Joseph Karsavich. Um, some of us uh, know Dr. Karsavich from a previous time when he sat on the governing council of the Community Health Center, oh, about six, seven years ago, I want to say. Yeah, maybe seven or eight years ago <laughs> um, for a period of time. So perhaps at this time, a doctor, if you'd like to say a couple of things uh, regarding yourself and uh, uh, maybe your past uh, uh, medical uh, practice, et cetera. <laughs> now, ba basically, I've been practicing in the area. I've been practicing in this area for about 40 plus years and then just retired in June. Um, so I've been active in, in a lot of different boards, a lot of different councils, the county medical society, and oh, I've talked to the mouse. Um, and then I was active in establishing the free clinic. Uh, so I've been I've been around fairly active. Thank you. Well, we welcome you Thank to the board. Thank you for uh, agreeing. Uh, before you go on, I, we have visitors here. Is this Lewis Nursing? Uh, okay, welcome. And uh, we'd like to say to you if you need any information from us, uh, contact Stephanie and she'll be happy to give you any information that you might need as far as Board of Health is concerned. And uh, our uh, division directors will introduce themselves when they give their reports so you know what each one of them do. Is that it, John? That's it. That's okay. it, John. Because All right, we'll move right along now. And uh, you received the exi the, uh, per the minutes for the August 20th, 2014 meeting. And uh, if there aren't any questions, amendments, changes, I'll introduce them. Second, Chief. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes have been approved. Mr. Babbage and Chief. Okay. We'll now have the treasurer's report, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sue Olmanek. I'm the Assistant Executive Director. Um, the division that I, um, that I supervise is the Division of Administrative Services. So, sorry. Hello. There you go. Hi. Uh, Sue Olenek, the Assistant Executive Director. I also oversee the Division of Administrative Services, which is basically the support and um, infrastructure division of the agency. Uh, I do IT, finance, HR, uh, security, 
um, sort of uh, front desk reception, accounts payable, um, and uh, facility management. So welcome. Okay, I'm going to take a look at the first page, the report of receipts and expenditures. Our beginning balance for the month was just uh, under $6.5 million. Our various receipts, uh, I'm sorry, total receipts, including a levy distribution, was just over $1.3 million. Our total expenditures for the month was just over $2.7 million, bringing our ending balance to just over $5.1 million. Next page is the schedule of revenue. As you can see at the top of the page, there's the uh, current levy distribution that we received, the 298440 That brings our percentage of uh, revenue for the agency at about 57%. Um, this is our quarter three ending, so we're looking at about a 75% target for uh, revenue and expenses. The uh, total fees and reimbursements rounded out to about 69%. If you see the uh, good portion of our revenue under the fees and reimbursements in August was uh, a, a payment of 389135 and that was the federal financial participation. If you recall, we received a generous sum last fiscal year, uh, just under about 900000 This year we received the 389 As you can see, we also don't budget for that, and we don't budget for it because we never know when we're going to receive it. Uh, we received dollars back from the federal government for uh, local dollars being invested in our uh, FQHC. This particular payment was for 2012. The one that we received in fiscal year 2013 was for fiscal years 11 and 12. So, you know, if, if at some point we feel like we're going to continue to receive this, then we will budget for it, but that's why it's not in there at this point. So that I think what you meant to say was this payment was for 2012, the last payment was for 2010 and 11. What did I say? You said 11 and 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, 10 and 11. Yes, the, the just under 900,000 was for fiscal year 10 and 11. Sorry. Uh, continuing on that schedule of revenue, you can see that uh, most of the divisions, health center, environmental health, family health services, and behavioral health all uh, just about met or exceeded the, the target for the month. We round out our grants and contracts uh, for the end of August at about 73%, and total agency revenue is at about 66%. The next page is the statement of expenditures. On your desk, you will see a revised copy. Um, I'll give you a little explanation as to why it's revised. Um, as you know, there's a lot of timing issues with the uh, generation of reports out of the financial system. And in this particular case, I had already generated and produced this report, uh, the report you found in your packet, prior to some expenses hitting the New World system. Uh, Denise Bergen prepared the quarter three report, and she was about $100,000 off of what I was finding. And so she, we figured it out, and it happened to be that the, the BMO, the, the corporate credit card expenses, had not yet hit the financial system. So I found it, since it was about $100,000 difference in expenses, I thought it was pertinent enough, that's enough of a change that you needed the revised information. And so that's why I did a revised report and provided that to you. If it was a couple of thousand dollars, I would have made mention of it, but that's why I revised the entire report. So if you look at your year-to-date expenses, you will see that it's, a, it's about a $100,000 difference. Um, again, uh, rounding out at the end of August, quarter three, we're looking at about 75%, and we are at 69.1% of our expenses. The changes in the uh, amounts you'll see were in supplies, professional and technical services, property services, and other purchased services, those, those middle sections. Um, obviously, Payroll wouldn't have been affected by that, nor would fringe, but all of those others are affected, and that's why the report was revised. Okay, and the last report is our statement of uh, on the capital improvement fund. Not a whole lot happened in there either, about a dollar ten in um, interest, making our, our change on <coughs> to 39,898.64. 
Okay, any questions on that? Uh, I, I will go over the, the quarterly report as well, but are there any questions on each report? Do we have a, uh, an amount for accounts received, accounts receivable from the state on Medicaid uh, at hand? An aging report? I don't have an aging report with me today, no I don't. Maybe when we get to uh, the health center, they may have uh, their paper. I do know that we're billing at about uh, 30 days, Mary. Is that correct? Uh, we're only three weeks. Behind. Three weeks. Okay, so good. Three weeks. And so we're running about 30 days. A little bit less than 30 days. Yes. Days. Good. That's very good. Yes, it's, it it's as good as it's ever been. <laughs> and, and the pay. Not only are we submitting within three weeks or so. But the payments from the state are on time as well. So it's, there, there is no large outstanding amount being held up in prior year. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if we could take a look at the quarterly report. Um, this is the third quarter report. Um, you should be familiar with the report. It's the same, same um, arrangement we've seen in the past. The first page that you should have in front of you is each division um, on the on the page with the dollar amounts for both the salaries, I'm sorry, for the expenses and the revenue. Um, as stated on the prior reports, so we're at about 56% of the levy coming in. So all of these all of these uh, amounts reflect that. The total expense, the 20,333, 263, 71, and the revenue, uh, 19,597,092 along with the expense recovery matches the amounts that are on the, the schedule of revenue. Okay. The second and third pages are basically a breakdown of each division. And it's broken out by not only uh, dollar amounts, but also percentages. If you take a look, um, you know, salaries and fringe really should be right about at the target of 75%. Most are. The expenses are there both in dollar amounts and uh, percentages. And overall, we're looking at, you know, fluctuations between anywhere from 65 to 70 to 86% of uh, expenses. But rounding out on that last page, on the summary, you can see the totals. Total expenses at 69%, total revenue at 66%. Any questions on the quarter three? No questions. There being no questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the treasurer's report as presented. So moved. Second. Dr. McDonald, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The treasurer's report has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll begin to go into our division reports, and we might as well just stay with you, uh, Sue. Sure. Um, do you have your Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, you have my report in front of me. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to entertain your questions. Uh, I do have a couple of things on the agenda. Uh, we have some exciting news about our Eastern Branch office. We've got a budget updates. Uh, but if you have any specific questions about my report, I'd be glad to answer those. Okay. Uh, no questions? Then, Dr. Thank you. Good. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Triani. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Programs here at the Will County Health Department. So welcome. Uh, my report for uh, September 2014, I'm first of all very glad to report that we had an extremely successful survey. Uh, at the exit conference, uh, we were only given six recommendations. To give you a contrast, uh, in 2011, we received 42 recommendations and we got a three-year accreditation. 2010, we got 120 recommendations in only one year. So uh, out of our seven car surveys, this is the best we have ever done. This also follows on the heels of 
an unannounced three-day survey uh, by the Illinois Department of Bureau of Accreditation Licensing and Certification. And again, um, we had the highest compliance score, 95%, for that three-day accreditation. And just uh, in terms of context, we had a DASA triannual survey back in March, and we got the best score ever. But uh, one of the things I just wanted to mention that uh, in pulling, uh, pulling together uh, the challenge of accreditation, um, it's just not behavioral health division. Uh, we worked very closely uh, with uh, both the executive director, assistant executive director, um, uh, human resources had a big part in this, as well as information technology and telecommunications. Uh, uh, the program coordinator for finance, facilities manager, and emergency response coordinator all were involved. There are entire sections of our accreditation uh, that are the support elements that uh, land with buildings and grounds and finance and HR. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a really good visit, a uh, good process. And uh, uh, on the uh, second page of my report, I just indicate uh, where the recommendations were. And the recommendations uh, are, are basically pretty minor. Uh, some of them, I would have to say, are, are even cosmetic. Uh, with your approval, we uh, executed the uh, contract with Presence uh, Healthcare, and we're waiting to see what role they'll have with the uh, uh, Medicaid rollout. Uh, I wanted to point out we had a good month financially from SAS. This is money received uh, since our last board meeting. We received $173,503.24 in SAS payments. So they, they are quickly turning around and uh, again, these are checks from SAS that were deposited. And in dealing with the new environment, we're now in the process of interviewing for a billing supervisor. Uh, because of the various managed care organizations we're gonna be dealing with, uh, we wanna tighten our, uh, our uh, uh, billing team and uh, we're taking an existing position um, and uh, uh, creating uh, the position of billing supervisor um, which will be used uh, to coordinate those efforts. And uh, the good news, as Mr. Cicero said, with uh, uh, money going over to managed care, uh, we're being promised a 30 to 45 day turnaround in terms of billing versus 12 months to 18 months as it has been historically. Um, that concludes my report. Are there any questions? There being no questions, thank you, Dr. Triani, and we'll go to Mary and uh, Community Health Center. Hello, I'm Mary Maragos, I'm a family nurse practitioner and the CEO of the Will County Community Health Center. Uh, good afternoon. Um, you, you have my grant in front of you, and I, I have an addition uh, to tell you about. Uh, first of all, you should know that uh, the uh, five grants that have been submitted, um, so far I did hear back on the first one, and we did receive an award uh, for, it was about um, $250,000. It was a construction grant um, to make uh, the facility uh, patient center medical home friendly. Uh, we have uh, prioritized the projects. It will involve um, um, mainly the clinical area, trying to make that uh, so that the physicians and the nurses can work together better uh, to make the front door um, handicap accessible Etc. And then uh, uh, most recently, um, we received a notice of our second award, and that was a HRSA grant. It was called a supplemental award um, for about two hundred forty-six thousand, and it, there was no end date, so uh, they were going to add that to our uh, standing grant award um, for as many years so long as we keep up our projected number of patients and visits. Now this was to expand medical services and also to um, change, amend our scope of practice to add behavioral health. So uh, we're very happy about that. It will involve hiring a full-time nurse practitioner who will uh, part-time see patients um, on a walk-in basis. So this will help us a lot to take care of our right number of walk-ins. And also to equip the dental plan <coughs> Dr. Streets, to, so that we can use it for medical visits. 
Yeah. And uh, so uh, we will uh, be looking for places in the community to do uh, medical screening and care. If you have any suggestions, please let us know. Uh, and then also the hiring of a licensed clinical social worker who we can bill for the services. And Billy will be looking for your students. And uh, we then can do uh, behavioral health and developmental screening, behavioral health management, and <coughs> substance abuse services. Just a, a comment regarding the first grant. That would be the uh, approximately $250,000 for some construction. We'll, we've reached out to uh, the architect that we've used to begin a discussion to probably put a, an agreement together, come back to the board to authorize us entering into an agreement to start getting some plans drafted uh, to uh, uh, basically uh, talk about the services that we're going to expand uh, capital-wise. So that'll be between now and the next month, we'll be meeting with the architect and getting these plans uh, put together. So more to come on that. And both of these grants will require uh, adding to the budget appropriating these funds, modifying the 2015 budget to make sure that we can spend uh, these dollars both this year and then next year. Mary, we have a couple of new uh, members. Would you want to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, high school uh, program you're working on? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, there is a uh, proposal we are putting forth to HRSA uh, for a new access point and uh, the, the, which means basically a satellite and we, we are proposing to add a school-based health center at Joliet Central High School. Uh, the grant is for $650,000 uh, for two years uh, and we've gotten a, a great support from the District 204 and the, the school administration as well as the community members. So it's something we're very excited about. Are there any questions for Mary? Thank you. And Mary, what is the biggest opposition I have for as far as having it be acceptable? I think I know. Well, so far we've, we've heard that we have some competition. Okay. So we, uh, you know, there's only so many federal dollars out there in the VNA health centers are also putting forth a grant proposal to add a primary care clinic in Joliet, roughly at Jefferson and Stryker Streets. Mary, okay, why don't you expand on that and talk a little bit about what the governing council, how it was presented to them and their decision. So they did come, they asked me and John for a letter of support um, and we didn't feel comfortable doing that. They, they want to put up a full service clinic at that site and claim that there were plenty of patients uh, left unserved and so we invited them to come to our governing council and um, and they gave a presentation and afterward it was decided that we would send them a letter of non-support explaining that this was in direct competition for what we are proposing and we felt that the need was greater for our project and that's why we could not support theirs so and I, I have been in touch with our HRSA project officer, and she is aware, and um, we're also going to send a similar letter to HRSA. How's the high school accepted? I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. Are they going to give us a letter of support for our proposal? Well, we have asked for one, but have not received it. Oh. <laughs> I've also asked Aunt Martha's, but no response there either. <laughs> is the high school very conscientious about wanting you to have it? They're very excited. In fact, not only that, but they're willing to give us their existing health office, which we're going to do some a little bit of construction renovation there. And then they're going to give up one of their classrooms and pay money to renovate that to make a new health office for their school nurse. So yes, they're, they're invested. A little pressure is being put out. I think that's great. Good. I think one of the important things that we found out uh, in attending the meeting, uh, governing council meeting, was that uh, the VNA uh, wants to put this unit at, at Stryker in Jefferson, and that's pretty close to where Aunt 
Martha just put one at St. Joseph's Hospital. Where's it going to be located, though? You know, you got what do you got? McDonald's there. You got the bank there. No, McDonald's Stri isn't Stryker, is it? That's Reed. It's Woodlawn. 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 Okay. Woodlawn. It's the same street. Yeah. On one side of Jefferson is Stryker, and the other side is Woodlawn. Yeah. Is there a vacant property there? One of the I have You know, you got the florist there. You got a car There's repair a shop. There. The Bank of America and McDonald's. There was a, a, an old car dealership, perhaps? Uh, well, there's a car dealership that is east of the corner. Mm -hmm. that, that might be it. They said there was, I think they said there was a seven acre lot, is what oh. they described in, the, in their presentation. Well, really, I don't know where I think we can only know. share with you what we were told, and that it, that's what we were told, Stryker and uh, Jefferson. So. Uh, if one of those buildings going to come down, or they you know there is there is a little strip mall that sits back from Jefferson Street. Yeah, there is. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, Doc? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it may th have been. Th there are some vacancies in there. Maybe they said near N or the in the vicinity of, as opposed to right on the interstate. Yeah. Well, is that shopping mall you're talking about where the DCFS is and so forth? No, D that's. DCFS is in the old jewel store. Yeah. But this is east of of uh, the DCFS. Oh, okay. Well, anyhow, that's what their plans are. And in discussing this, I, I think we should realize that they took the uh, figures from the uh, zip codes. Uh, that were, the, and then they came up with underserved population. Then from the UDS report uh, for Aunt Martha's and for our health center, they subtracted those two numbers from that, the underserved, and came up and said, this is the amount of people that are underserved. Well, that would be all right if all those people were looking for a federally qualified health center. Some of them go to doctors on Medicaid, which are not a part of this calculation. Some people just don't want to go to the doctor, even though they are underserved. So our experience right now is our health center demographics show that we are dropping. We're trying to bring it up, but right now it's declining. Aunt Martha's having the same situation. So we don't know if all those people out are out there that the VNA says are out there. Is that pretty much? John, excuse me, you have the striker high rise there. That's right. I don't know if the the people that they're counting lived in that that high rise that are not being served. I don't know. Well, they had it by zip code, and uh, I don't know. That's a six, seven story building, and I don't know how many residents are in that building. But, but I would say every one of them is on Medicare. Yeah, Medicare. So that could be a two. Service. Yeah. Whatever. Is there any more to add to that? that anyone that was at the meeting, Paul? No, you don't pay too much. Is that about it? You go according to what's well, I, I would just like to add one thing that we did bring up to the governing council, and I'd like to bring up. We would like to bring up to you. Um, if it was just a question of need, there's no doubt that our proposal would be funded. For example, the state of Illinois Department of Public Health has actually one of the best school-based health center programs in the country, they oversee all 64 school-based health centers. Um, they say that this health center, proposed health center, is probably the one that's most needy in the entire state. Uh, as you may know, Will County does not have any school-based clinics, and there's a tremendous need for that. However, um, for more than a decade, these decisions are often political. Um, that's why you see health centers being spent uh, with our tax money being built within a few blocks of each other, particularly in places like Chicago and other densely populated places. So we really need your help um, to get any letters of support from appropriate people, including elected officials, particularly federally elected officials. 
and I'd ask that you work with Mary, and uh, any of those letters you can get for us will be very important. Any other questions? Dr. Ehrman, do you have a report? Yes. Good afternoon, and welcome to uh, our new board member. Uh, it's good to see another physician here. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the students. Hope you come visit us and maybe decide to work at our health center. So you have a written report from me. I just wanted to uh, talk about a few things. Um, we had a, we have a great new physician on board who started uh, 10 days ago named Dr. Uh, Tracy Vera. She's a full-time obstetrician who works both in our health center and also at Silver Cross Hospital, and she'll be partnering with Dr. Williams uh, to do both deliveries, C-sections, uh, as well as elective gynae surgery over there, and certainly do a lot of good work in our health center. She speaks Spanish fluently and has already started to attract a large number of patients. So that's quite positive. Uh, some other good news is that uh, when I first arrived here, there was about a four month wait for women to get elective gynecological surgery. Uh, we've cut that back a little bit by getting what's called a block time. We actually have a reserve time every month uh, for these surgeries. Um, so that started in May. And starting either next month or November, we're gonna have a second day of block time. Uh, so that would be very helpful. Uh, we also have instituted a new protocol this summer, uh, which took a little while to get off the ground, but it's now working where, I guess for the first time, I've been told, we're able to make family appointments. Uh, in the past, if a parent, uh, either a male or female, came with their kid, they were given two different appointments with two different providers, often on two different days. Um, now we're at least offering them a, an appointment with one of our three family practitioners, uh, and that's beginning to pick up steam um, and I think has been well accepted by the community. In terms of our um, statistics that the board president referred to, uh, unfortunately the overall statistics uh, do show a decrease of 5% um, over last year. However, there are some bright spots I wanna highlight and then explain how we compare it to other entities like ours. Uh, for the first time since I've been here, we've seen a 2% increase in ob visits. And one, this actually isn't capturing all the ob visits because beginning in June, our three family practitioners are also seeing family planning and gynecological patients. They've been trained to do this, they've been certified. And so we've opened up uh, each week uh, a couple dozen new spots for the OB providers to see pregnant women. Uh, so that's a significant um, input into this data. Uh, the other positive thing is that the overall dental visits both in the van and the clinic have gone up. Um, and even though there's a 5% decrease from talking to my former colleagues and Aunt Martha's, um, it's much better. And also I, I was at a meeting of 25 medical directors Friday and Saturday. We're doing much better than most people in densely populated areas where there's several FQHCs. So that doesn't mean we're satisfied with it. Um, but we're gonna be really pushing ahead. The other good news is that we've averaged 500 new patients a month uh, since the beginning of this fiscal year. So we've seen about 4,500 new patients. Uh, that's for a number of reasons. We've really increased our outreach. Uh, we've also had a lot of outreach from both the health department and the health center for the Affordable Care Act to get many more people, both existing patients and potentially new patients on the Medicaid. And I think that's starting to bear fruit. Uh, we can't tell you if all those patients that probably are not coming to our clinic, but certainly 500 a month is a very good sign. I liked your report on the uh, analysis of appointments. Uh, is, is there some way in the future that you can subtotal those by discipline? Yes. OB and family planning and so right. So I didn't bring it with me because it's really not complete, but uh, President Hines and John Cicero Sue have seen this. Um, what's happening is um, our project manager is extremely busy. I didn't talk about this, but um, for the next several weeks, we're going through a huge upgrade of our electronic medical record. And so that involves everyone in the health center. But what he started to do, and we'll have it for you by the next board meeting, is that we're breaking down the, the actual visits by discipline. So we'll see all the adult patients, all the PS <coughs> patients, all the OB, all the gynae, and all the family planning. Because the family practitioners see all of those patients except for OB, 
the numbers you have before you don't show you um, all the adult patients, so all the family planning or all the guiding patients or kids patients. So I think it'll be a lot better picture. We'll also in the future, uh, I can't say it's going to be next month because of the upgrade, we'll be able to identify um, how many of those patients come back within the same year or the same quarter. So that's a very important thing. Um, we also have data that's kept every month on numbers of patients who are both canceling appointments and no-shows. Um, I can say that I was really surprised when I got here because we only have uh, basically about a 10 to 11 percent no-show rate. We have about 20 percent of the patients overall who actually call to cancel, which is quite unusual for an FQHC that people actually take the time to call. So we're working to really decrease that rate, um, you know, through a number of processes that we're implementing. changes actually on my report at all. Um, I did want to just highlight that Mark Ackerman from the US EPA did come out and went sampling with our samplers and toured the lab. So that was very exciting and he was very impressed with our program. And I just also wanted to just update the West Nile numbers. According to IDPH's website, we're up to 11 cases in the state. Other than that, I do have my uh, food, or, I'm sorry, the sewage ordinance up for uh, proposed amendments that we will talk about a little bit later. We don't have anything else. Any questions? So, I mean, uh, Elizabeth, this cupcake law, how does that <laughs> apply to uh, church groups that have bakery sales and... Uh, uh, the and cupcake law is very specific to um, individuals that want to make uh, pre non-potentially hazardous baked goods in their home in a county that has passed a ordinance allowing it. So it's for in individuals that want to do that. So it's it's not really... Um, but I mean, individuals bring certain items to these bake sales, so that's considered a group that, uh, you know, the, the bake sale? The bake sale, sale there is some, um, through IDPH, there, there are some guidance on bake sales through the farmer's market um, technical release yeah, and right. that is specific to if you are a nonprofit organization and you do an occasional bake sale which is a non potentially hazardous item um, you have to placard in a certain way there's some verbiage and we can't permit that you know of course because that's a, a homemade product but that there are there is some guidance in the technical release from the state in the farmer's market um, brochure so that we're trying to keep them separate at this point and um, direct people to the farmer's market technical guidance when they do want to do a bake sale. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pat. Okay, I'm Pat Bain Schuster. Um, I'm the Director of Family Health Services. Uh, I have 19 different programs, mostly the self health health and anything to do with health, health promotion, promotion. Okay. All right, I just have a few things. One of them is I wanted to point out a mistake. I seem to be good at pointing out mistakes. Uh, no, I, I did notice we talked last time about how we were changing the category from we were no longer going to follow immunizations with CHC physician visit uh, on my statistics. And these numbers are actually the number of better birth outcome clients. So that's why we had 44. Uh, was our caseload for that. So we'll make sure that gets corrected next time. I don't know if we're using an old template or I didn't hit save on the computer when I made that change. But the number is accurate for the number of better birth outcome clients. And the reason that's not totally, we're now at caseload of 60, but at that point we had a new person that was hired as the better birth outcomes nurse and our manager was training her and things were moving a little slower. But we're up to caseload again now. So. All right, uh, we're pretty busy with, uh, we received the new in-person counselor grant, so we will, in the process of hiring, uh, we do, uh, last time we had, last year we had four full-time in-person counselors, this time uh, we have to have five, so we are busy moving rooms at this point, is to try to 
accommodate uh, the new or the fifth person. As everyone knows in family health services, we utilize every space possible. Every every closet has turned into something. So we're we're full to the seams here. Uh, we're going to break open one of these days. But we did make it. We did make it. So. Uh, we're just in the process of moving people down the, down the line, and they're all going to fit. But we're real excited about that, and I know City Jackson's already got interviews set up, and we did have many internal applicants on that. So. That's, that's good news, because remember that grant ended uh, at the end of August, and we had to, you know, there were some staff that could be affected uh, that you know, may have been laid off if we did not receive continuation funding. We did. So we didn't have uh, have any issues. Those two staff remain, and they'll be recruiting for three more for the complement of five. So. And the two that remain uh, have already um, renewed their insurance license. They've already got all their, their CEUs up to date on what they had, the continuing had things they had to do. So those two are ready to hit the ground running, um, and we do have applicants that do have experience. So hopefully we'll be able to get them in soon also. So we've been very busy with that lately, and also we're, we're uh, getting down to the wire here on the Will County, the MAP Fall Forum. That's going to be on Tuesday, September 30th. I know we talked about it last time. We've got some great speakers. It's all lining up well, and we've got quite a few people um, that have <coughs> RSVP'd. I know as of last week, we had over 70 people already, so that was very good. That's going to be at present St. Joe's Hospital. So. Okay. Are you getting any... Uh, calls from the public <coughs> relating to the Ebola virus? No. If we are, I'm not, I, I don't know if Vic has gotten Victor, some, but we, I, we haven't gotten them in our division. We probably average about five calls a week between uh, telephone calls and email inquiries. We, we do get a smattering of calls. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't heard anything from Al Pesh that he's reported anything about that. So I think all the general calls seem to go to Vic. If anything specific would go to Alpesh. I would imagine you probably would receive more calls regarding the enteral virus, that D68 yes. virus, more so than Ebola. Maybe familiar with that. That's been certainly circulating. Jackie. Jackie Nashville, I'm an emergency response coordinator here. I am in charge of the Will County Pharmaceutical Distribution Plan, or affectionately known as the SNS plan, and that is to medicate the whole county in case of an anthrax or a bioterrorism event within 48 hours. Okay? It's a wonderful job. Um, <laughs> easy. Okay. But anyway, um, just, to, just to share, um, we, we have had the delight to work with. Um, with uh, behavioral health, with getting ready, getting things ready for their car, and that and that was a fun interaction and getting everything done, and it's helped us to spare on some other things as well. When we have um, electrical power outages and and water issues like last night, uh, we do after action reports. We get it all done. It's all done within about uh, 24 to 48 hours. So we're really doing stepping up in that process because many of the grants and the cert, um, and uh, the different um, regular regulatory uh, systems are really looking for that. So, um, so that's kind of uh, fallen in EPNR, and we love it, and we know how to do it. And so that's what's going on. And it's been great collaboration with the rest of the divisions when we when those things happen, um, even if they're only for 10 or 15 minutes. We try to do that. Um, on my report, I just want to share that um, we are working with Rasmussen College. Um, we had Allison had a contact over there, and we are working with them. They are counting their volunteers that come into the um, Medical Reserve Corps as volunteers, and they get credit at school for that. Um, so there, we're getting a lot of volunteers for that, and, and hopefully once they're through school, they'll also stay with us and continue. Um, but that's nursing um, students, and we're also looking at that college being one of our closed um, points of dispensing as well for their students and their staff. Um, the other thing you might have seen are some charts in here, and I just pulled them in this month just to show you. Um, this comes from, uh, we got our uh, grant money, about 3500 from Medical Reserve Corps, or from um, the uh, NATO grant, 
And we get that every year, and so we have to plug in every activity that we do with our volunteers or our volunteers are involved in. And so I just kind of wanted to show you what the state, the region, the national average, the second one is, um, and how we're doing. Even though we may have only had five events, we're doing more than many of the rest of them. Um, and so also that um, we had about 20 volunteers involved in five different things. And this is from the last board meeting to um, the time of 9-10 when we uh, finished this report. And we have two events this last weekend, and we have, a, uh, you can see on our, my report, several other events coming up that our volunteers are going to be involved in. Um, so that will help you. The other thing we're involved in with the Will County Citizens Corps this year for uh, September being prepared month, preparedness month is we, um, we championed with them a pandemic or flu prevention hand washing campaign for our daycare centers, homes, and um, that group. And so we sent out packets to 602 daycares, uh, centers, and homes, as well as Head Start. And um, we asked them uh, to go online and find information, but also to order some information from us. And we did that so we could kind of figure out how many people are actually doing this. And so just to give you an idea, we have what's called a cough cling that goes on a mirror. It just, it's not um, glue, it just clings up there. And, uh, and so we've had 212 responses for that. Now, we have about 40 daycares that are obviously have moved. <laughs> Um, and so we got some returns, we have to clean that uh, system up. But we had almost 3,000 people asking for color, uh, for 3,000 coloring pages. Some of them called and they said, we'll make our own copies, we just want to let you know we're doing it. So, um, and that was fine, but we did that so that we would know which groups were actually doing it. Um, we also sent out um, a, pa uh, a brochure on the flu. And, um, and we got 307 requests, uh, 307 different packets, 308 uh, for what you need to know about pandemics. And then Greg Krantz, who's in Family Health Services, is a contact, uh, the nurse who works with the daycare centers and homes. And we also offered him to go out and do a home, or do a visit, and take out the kit and show the kids how to wash their hands, and that shows the germs under the black light. Well, he's gotten 16 responses thus far for them, for people wanting to come out just in September. So, so we think that even though there were a lot of them that were contacted, we still got a decent response from it, and that it showed. And even if they didn't get back to us, we got that we got the information we needed out to all those daycare homes and centers. And the Will County uh, Citizen Corps is made up of. Police departments and other groups who have um, uh, CERT teams or community response emergency uh, community emergency response teams within the county. There's probably about ten of them. So uh, so that's what we worked on. We worked with them on this year. So uh, that has been a big response out of our office that Robin has done a great job on. So and getting all that stuff out and Allison and myself. So. Um, the rest of it, I think you can read and kind of see what's going on. We're in the process of doing all of our updates with our all the divisions, one on employee safety, that some of those are completed, some of them are scheduled, and also on the uh, distribution plan. And we have some scheduled, some to be scheduled yet on that. We have till June, so it's not like we have to do it right away, but we want to get in there and take care of that. So uh, that's, kind of, um, that's kind of where we're at. Any questions? Vic, uh, do you have anything to add other than the report that you submitted? No, I do not. Thanks. Yes, you know, just one comment about Ebola. I have had a couple calls from refineries and groups in town wanting to know, you know, since they have people that come in from other countries, mm -hmm. and we've just sent the information out to them and explained to them that it's not respiratory, it's not a respiratory disease, those kinds of things. So, but that, that's about all. And if I may say, that has been kind of the uh, the tenor of the calls we have received, is there any possibility that this may develop to where it can be spread from person to person uh, in the conventional way, coughing, sneezing? So once we allay their, those fears, uh, the questions seem to go away. Thank you, Vic. Okay, that will conclude our division report. We appreciate uh, the report you submitted and your comments regarding your reports. Thank you. Now we will move on to old business and under old business we will have Sue talk about the budget 2015.
Okay, um, the fiscal 2015 budget. Well, as you know, our process starts um, when we prepare the budget for the next fiscal year. Our process starts in usually mid to late May. Um, so by now, we have done, I have worked through probably four, five, six different versions. Um, in your packet, in the, in the board packet, you should have my memo. You should have two revenue sheets. They're the ones with the kind of the pink trim on them. You should have a summary expense sheet. And then you should have a multi-page report that looks like it was kind of system generated. And so that is uh, kind of what we're going to go through. All right, we'll start on the, uh, start with the revenue budget, but just a, a few comments initially. Uh, as I said, we start the budget process back in late May. Um, we take a very, uh, a, a very careful approach. We take a very uh, regimented approach every year when we start to prepare the budget. Uh, John and I work uh, independently and together with each uh, division. We look at all of the revenue line items. We look at all of the expense line items. Um, we don't take anything for granted. We, we start basically from zero and start building up as to what are going to be our revenues and our expenses for the next fiscal year. We are provided with some guidance from the county finance department and typically that guidance has to do with whether or not to incorporate wages, uh, any wage increases, uh, what the insurance uh, per FTE is going to cost. Uh, what the IMRF and FICOR contributions are going to be. All of that information is typically given to us um, by the county. So our first version includes all of that information. Now through the budget process, through these multiple versions that we've worked through, um, we did get some good news from the county. Uh, one of those came in uh, a little relief with our health insurance cost. Initially, we were requested to uh, incorporate a, a FTE number of 17700 per FTE for health insurance costs. So we built that number in. Um, we, we were told later in the process that we could back that number down to about 16300 If you recall, the county through the union negotiations has landed on a different uh, kind of insurance structure plan. The employees are um, contributing more to their health insurance costs. So that in turn should have you know, been some reduction for us as an agency, and it has. So that one item alone um, made a difference in our budget of about 455,000. So you look at the number of employees we have, uh, the difference of about $1,400 per employee, it was a significant savings. Um, so we uh, have looked at the budget, we've um, looked at each revenue line item, like I said, each expense line item, um, we'll go through it. I do have, uh, I'm not going to go through every line, obviously, but I do have some, uh, some things I'd like to mention. Uh, we look at trends. We look at your dates. Um, as you see on the, the revenue the revenue sheet, we've provided some historical information. We've got 2010 actual, 2011, 2012, 2013 actual, 2014 budget, the budget we're working under now, and then I included an 831, our quarter three year to date. And you know that's the, the, the best numbers we have right now as far as um, uh, looking forward to the, the next budget year on both the expenses and the revenue. Okay, so let's start with uh, the revenue piece. And I'm looking at the one that starts with fees and reimbursables. Um, really wasn't much change with administration or environmental health. Uh, or behavioral health for that matter. Um, the, the bottom line of behavioral health remain the same, although you can see that there are there were some, some changes uh, in some of those items, but overall it shook out about the same. In the community health center, we did see a significant significant decrease in their fees, uh, a little over 400,000, and we're seeing a, a little bit different payer mix taking place. So we took all that into account and, uh, you know, looked at our trending, looked at you know Medicaid, uh, all of the different payer sources, 
and we've come up with what we think is uh, a, a good revenue number there for the health center. Family Health Services was, was pretty much unchanged, so there's not much to mention there. On the next page for grants, um, just a couple of minor changes in administration, um, not really much to speak of, a little bit higher in revenue. Uh, emergency preparedness, a little bit higher number there at 458907 that's the, 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 grant, uh, the grants. We received two major grants in bioterrorism. That's the grant number. In the Community Health Center, we saw not really a significant uh, decrease there in the grants. Um, their most significant revenue generation in, in grants is their 330 base grant. Um, that 1.4 million does include the IPC supplemental funding that we were talking about previously. And as additional dollars need to be built in, we will, we will do that as well for 2015. In environmental health, uh, under grants, the only uh, real significant change was a, a decrease in the West Nile Prevention Grant. Um, you can see that there. Family Health Services, uh, fairly unchanged. We did a little bit of swap there. We had a little bit more money in, in WIC, and we also received the dollars for the IPC. That's in there as well. And in behavioral health, uh, not much, uh, not anything real significant there other than uh, a decrease in trend for the respite program. We did receive a, another piece of good news, and that is uh, an increase, a slight increase for the REVI, uh, I'm sorry, levy allocation from the county. Um, instead of the 9.451 <coughs> we received and incorporated into this budget, we'll be receiving hopefully. Uh, once the budget is is, uh, is approved by the county board, uh, we might see a, an increase to 9.640596. Uh, on the summary of the revenue sheet, you can see it's, it's trending truly towards back, back towards a, a one third, one third, one third, um, you know, cycle here of fees, grants, and taxes. Uh, all along, we were typically looking at that as our revenue source and. Over the last few years, it kind of got a little skewed with fees, kind of got a little skewed with grants, but we're really back to a, a genuinely, um, you know, one third, one third, one third um, trend here. You can't, you can't get much closer no. than that. I mean, those are truly one, you know, three yeah. sources each providing about a third of the revenue. Yes. So, um, so there, there's the revenue picture. Uh, before we go on, does anyone have any questions about? Revenue? Or any of the numbers? Okay. On the expense summary, if we could look at that. <clears throat> we could look at that. Um, full time salaries, uh, that, that we had to increase a little bit. Uh, the union contract that we're uh, working under right now will call for, um, I had called for increases previously, so we need to incorporate those increases from this year into next year's budget. Um, the wage increase that the staff will be receiving, the bargaining unit staff that will be receiving this next year is not, the, the dollar is not, those dollars are not in this, these numbers, not in the expenses. So we will have to find that uh, throughout the year through attrition, keeping positions um, uh, frozen for a while and that sort of thing. Our temporary salaries, um, we've budgeted a little bit less there, overtime a little bit less. Um, overall, as you can see, expenses uh, really very closely match the expenses that we had for, for this year's budget. And then lastly, as I said, this uh, is a printout. If any of you were interested, would like to see the actual breakdown by division of the line items for the expenses, whether it's salaries, fringe, um, supplies, whatever it is. We thought we would uh, share that with you as well so you can see how it goes out. Any questions? There's lots of work. Too. Pardon me? Lots of work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's not just, you know, John and I, everybody no. here participates. No, I know. It's a very collaborative process, but it's also a very fluid process. Um, you know, a lot of times we find out late in June whether or not we're receiving grants for the next year from the state. Uh, 
we're still receiving information about grants coming up, so it's a very fluid process. Why, why would the wage increase not be shown? Um, we were advised um, to not include the fiscal 2015 increases for bargaining unit staff when we prepared this budget. Initially, those were the, that was the guidance we received. As we went through the process, um, we were told to take them out. That's actually the process that we followed probably for the last four or five years and that the wage increases are covered internally by the departments through turnover, attrition, et cetera. If you remember, maybe a month or so ago, we talked about taking a turnover factor against the salaries, in other words, planning for that turnover. So instead of funding salaries at 100%, maybe we fund them at 97% because we know we never spend 100% of salaries. Well, in lieu of doing that, we have funded the positions at 100% looking to capture that turnover, those turnover dollars. But you're funding them at 100% of what, the previous year? Current salary, yes. Okay. So all of all the current salaries are funded at 100% where we are today with the expectation that we have never, probably in the last 10 years, spent 100% of the salary I line understand. items. I think it would be helpful to the board to have a number, though, at least to have a, a number of what, under current circumstances, what, what that goes would unspent? Be. Now, what would the wage increase be if you perhaps employed every single person that you employed right now? That, what was that number, Sue? Like three, three to four hundred thousand? Yeah, somewhere. Yes, yeah. so we do have that number. Just so then, the three to four hundred thousand dollars is made up by attrition or by whatever. Yeah, positions. changes in employees, right. to part-time people, whatever. Right. 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 Okay. Right. It's pretty common practice here, and you can the division heads can attest to it that we don't really post anything right away. Um, things. <laughs> it, it gets frustrating, I know. <laughs> things don't get posted right away. Positions become vacant, whether through retirement, resignation, um, and, and we sit on it for a little bit. And uh, that does save dollars in that line item. Did, uh, did we blend in the increases that were uh, approved for this year? that we were told not to put in for this year's budget. Yes, both. But those are blended in in the actual this year. Correct. Correct, yes. So what is not in there is what is supposed to go into effect in 2015. Correct. There's uh, two two things that will happen as far as the bargaining unit um, that were required by contract to, to, to do, and that is January 1st, will be a 1.5% increase for bargaining unit and then in J june 1st of 2015 there'll be a two-step motion on the pay grade so those two things will happen it's by contract we're obligated to do that so then on the fringe you count that increase on every employee that you have in the budget correct yeah the fica and imrf on you know fica on total wages and health insurance and per FTE, yes. Any other questions? Do we need uh, to approve this, John, I, officially? Or? I don't think so. I think we really need, I mean, because it really mm -hmm. isn't official until the county. It hasn't even been released. <laughs> you all are going to get it, I think, tomorrow. 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 And there's this yeah. whole process at the county level, and really the only thing that may change is really the levy allocation. So if something changes there, then we'll have to come back and reincorporate. So no, this board traditionally does their final approval in the in the fall, like in November, mm -hmm. before it becomes effective. Well, so I guess what we're saying is we're giving you a consensus to present it to the board. And then we'll officially approve it once they approve it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sue. Any other questions? Okay, John, you want to 
to talk about the East Branch office or do you want to see I can give you a, a quick update there. Uh, we have, over the last 30 days since our last meeting, had several discussions back and forth with the uh, uh, landlord of the facility and we have finally landed on the lease agreement that covers all of the parameters that you all gave us authorization to work on and uh, President Hines actually signed that a little while ago right before the meeting. So our lease is signed and executed. We've got an estimated move-in date of January 1 of 15 and as soon as uh, that's going to take, you know, the, the time period will be for the build-out for the new site in Moni. So as soon as Sue is able to get that document back to them, I imagine they will begin a timetable. They've already got, I believe, the contractor uh, under agreement, yes. correct, to yes. begin the work? Yes, they've been working on that kind of in the background, anticipating that this would take place. So um, a couple of next steps here. Uh, obviously, I'll get this back to our, um, our agent that we're working with tomorrow. And then we also have to kind of wrap things up with our current um, our current landlord over in University Park. Uh, I've been in um, discussion with the, the manager over there, the village manager, um, and uh, they did present us with uh, another lease to move forward. Um, they're unaware that you know, we're in the process of looking at doing this, um, but we are in a month-to-month -month lease with them at this point. Um, and now that we do have a signed document, now that it's kind of a done deal, I will um, you know, provide a notice in writing to University Park um, as a courtesy to let them know that you know, we're looking to stay month to month until we would like to, you know, we would probably have a move out date sometime in early January. Uh, so that will happen. How many square feet are we running? Uh, 3896, so about four. And what did we get? We had 3850, but um, that 3850 did not include public restrooms. So those were in a common area. So what we've had to do is now incorporate uh, public restrooms and a employee restroom in our space. But um, we worked with a space utilization team and our team here, and we've come up with, I think, a very workable, usable, efficient space. How much is square foot? Uh, what was it? Nineteen. I believe it was twenty-one dollars with the camp. With the camp, yes. With the common area maintenance and the property tax. Came well within the parameters that the board presented for us, and comes well within our budget <coughs> that we have. Um, the other step, uh, in addition to um, kind tying up the loose ends with University Park, is uh, I'll develop a work group here. Uh, to move forward in planning the, the move and all of the little details that need to take place uh, for this to happen and to happen on time. Uh, you know, we're hoping and, and, you know, we're counting on this particular, uh, you know, frontline partners to do their piece and to build out and stay on time. We need to stay on time too. So we'll develop a work group here with um, representatives uh, from each um, division that, that have space over at the health center. Um, Center, over at the EBO office and come up with a plan. We've got, you know, we've got signage, we've got um, moving details, we've got lots of things to consider. So we'll move through that together. You mentioned property taxes. Uh, government agencies aren't exempt from paying property Steve, taxes. As part of the common area maintenance, the, the real estate taxes assessed to the owner of the facility based on the percentage of increase year over year or assessed a piece of that? Yeah, we do pay that at our Northern Branch office. That's part of the camp as well. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for the update. You're welcome. Any questions? All right, uh, Mary, uh, we're going to come back to you uh, and see if you have additional uh, information that you want to share with us on the community health center, school-based health center, other than what you've already said. you have more? Well, she does. They're in your packet. We provided the, the business plan. You want to kind of walk through that of the school-based center? Kind of showing the, the financing, the revenue, 
that we anticipate to generate, the expenses, where the grant comes in. That should have been right after the uh, budget documents. Mm -hmm. Back in. Everybody find those? They're, they're, okay. You'll notice at the end there's a list of um, assumptions. Um, we just have a, a preliminary count on um, the insurance makeup of the students. We surveyed 2,500 out of the 30 months. So, It takes a second. It's on now. The, the switch yeah. is on, but there's no light, so I'm wondering if there's an address Emergency management. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, can you sign it? Remember Jackie? CPR, please. Yeah, and Joe's got a policy. You're the physician. This is our disaster planning. <laughs> Anybody got some batteries in their pocket? <laughs> Sue, Sue talked too long. <laughs> I will just shout. Tell me about I'll it. go check another one. Okay. Okay. So there's still some information that's yet to be found out. Next Tuesday, I'm going to be meeting with the, the Vice President for uh, Business Management of District 204. And uh, he will share with me if there will be any cost that we will incur so far as rent or utilities. So I don't have that information here on this budget. Uh, Mary, do you have any idea how many of the individuals you're counting here as potential patients are already patients of the health center? Uh, I do. We, uh, we, we were looking into getting that data. I don't have that right in front of you now. We, we asked them in surveys mm -hmm. if they were already our patient or not. Um, and the best we could tell so far, about 40% who were not our patients said they would definitely come to see us. So that's looking good. One thing about, um, there, there are a number of adolescent you know, students there uh, that, you know, we don't know the exact numbers yet, but our patients, for example, for family, oh, it's what kind of said I told you. Don't talk too long, the red lights on. Yeah, for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, come see uh, Trisha Harris and other providers for family planning. However, there's a high no-show rate, um, as is true with most teens going to a place like this. So we think not only will there be more patients, but the chance of them actually showing up will really improve greatly if we have the health center in the school. The, it, as far as the financial picture, what we know is that it's a two-year grant, $650,000 for the first two years. And you can see that we've got our expenses estimated along with the revenue that we will generate on site estimated. The $650,000 grant is built in. Now, I'm sure you're fast-forwarding saying, well, what happens in year three? What happens after, after your first two years? And what we know is that continuation grants will be based on need, availability of funds, not a given that, that the base grant money continues. There's some expectation that you will, you will be able to cover your expenses by the revenue that you generate after building up the, the population, if you will. However, obviously, you know, we do not anticipate having any local money to put in here. So beginning in year three, if our expenses stay up here, but with the grant being gone and the revenue that we generate, we can't, we can't cover that, then we're gonna to have to look at what does that mean? Does that, look, does that mean that we scale back some of the expenditures? And maybe with the staffing level <coughs> are adjusted? Might the school consider having any dollars to contribute? But 
we're going into this, at least my understanding with Mary is that, you know, when year three starts, we don't have a big subsidy to offset what we might not be able to generate. So we've got two years to show the numbers, to ramp up, and hopefully to be able to generate enough money for it to be sustained. You're not going to, you're going to be operating 12 months a year, even when the school is closed. Correct. Does that mean that the school will allow anybody who wishes to come to that location to come there? Or are they limiting it just to students and their family? We're going to start there. We're going to start with students and their families. And But it's interesting that I went to a luncheon today at the, at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and uh, Sue and I were talking with one of the school board members, and she made a comment about, oh, you know, we they envision that when they're, they're doing a large um, addition uh, to Joliet Central. I don't know if any of you have seen that. But they're envisioning that it would become a hub mm -hmm. for the community um, and draw community members to use that facility for other things other than the school. And so we mentioned, well, that, that would be nice for us. And she said, yes, that, that will tie in well with our plans for the community. So we don't, we don't want to specifically go there right now, but we're, gonna, we're heading there. Well, if you don't have community participation in that center, then the summer months are going to be pretty slow. You'll probably staff accordingly with presumably. Right, because the majority of the students will not be there. They won't be in the summer. You may have a few, but... <laughs> so if I could just make some comments to John's welfare words. Um, there's a couple things you should know. I can't remember if we talk about this for so if you have, it's coming up. Number one, um, the Illinois state regulations allow any of the students to be seen um, in the health center, even if their medical home, if they have a Medicaid card, is in another place and we still get reimbursed. This is the only kind of exception to the rule that if your medical card is with another primary care provider in a medical home, uh, we would still get reimbursed for those visits. So at, that, at the encounter rate or at the, at the, at the, the, encounter, rate. At the $133 encounter rate? So that's one positive thing. Um, the other thing is we, we know um, from our own data and from anecdotal data that we talked to the principal about, there's probably a significant number in the hundreds of students out of the over 3,000 that are there who are definitely are eligible for Medicaid, but they're not, for one reason or another, have the Medicaid card at the moment. So, so we're going we're gonna to have um, the person who's going to be at the front desk will be trained on how to enroll both the students and their parents if they're eligible into Medicaid. So that will help. Um, being that this grant has to start in May, um, the first summer, realistically, it would probably just be the students and the parents because the concern is most school-based health centers in Illinois do not have access from the community. In fact, most of them don't even have access of the parents. So the school board and the principal were very supportive of the idea that at least the parents would have access, and so would the staff if they chose to do that. The, the problem is, is that most of the ones that I know of that do have access for the community, they have an external door uh, that's on the first floor, and that's not physically where the right now the clinic's going to be. So those details would have to be worked out, as well as the general security for the general community to have access. But they seem they're open to that idea. Now the services that you're going to provide are only the services that the health center provides, or are you going to have uh, some of our other divisions supplement? Uh, say for example WIC or the STD program and various things like that. We will we'll certainly be doing STD screening and treatment and that's what the health center does now. Um, we're open to having WIC there of course and uh, the dental van will come and park in the parking lot. We also um, have an agreement from the Lions Club they're willing to come once a month and screen uh, for vision, and they said they have a pot of money for those who are uninsured, and they can get them further treatment if needed. Are there any other questions? Are they going to be located in that new field house? 
No, floor? it's in, going to be in the existing health office. It's on the second floor. Second floor. Okay. So by the time this board meets again, the grant will have been submitted. The October 6th, 7th? 7th. 7th, October 7th. So you've, you've got a kind of a snapshot of what the budget will look like. Um, we've already kind of talked a little bit about the narrative, what the plans are. So we will get this submitted and along with our letters of support, keep our fingers crossed. And this is the competing grant with the BNA we were talking about earlier. But it's with the BNA and everybody else. That's, that's correct. That's, yeah, that's correct. a big correct. pool of people here. Correct. It could be all over the state of the country. So. One of the uh, unusual things that's happening with the BNA and Aunt Martha's and us, each one has their own project officer in Washington. So we have competing project officers. Instead of having one for Joliet or Will County, they bring their project officer with them from wherever they have their headquarters. Okay. Going into new business now, <clears throat> we have resolution 1428, which is approval for the amendment to the Will County Sewage Treatment and Disposal Ordinance. Couple of couple of comments before you you all consider this. Uh, one of the things that we did do, uh, and we appreciate uh, Mr. Zelko's uh, willingness to sit with Elizabeth. Malata and myself to actually go over uh, the ordinance and all of the proposed changes, clarify some of the recommendations that we're making. We did that a week or so ago, and uh, and I think everybody was comfortable with um, you know what we've put together and what the changes are. So at this point, Elizabeth can explain you know any of the changes. There's you know kind of a two pager. Uh, outlining the a summary of changes. There's 41 minor uh, changes. I don't want to take time to go through 41 items, but if there are some things that you'd like clarified, I think Elizabeth can do that. Our next step after you all approving this will be taking it forward to the Health and Safety Committee at the county for consideration and then to the full county board. Elizabeth, any comments? Um, I just do want to reiterate that we did get this approved through Chad Norman at Illinois Department of Public Health and also through the Will County State's Attorney prior to bringing it here. So both entities did review it and uh, were okay with the changes. If you look at the 41, my 41 bullets of what was changed, most of it is very minor changes. Um, the section that we did have to change the most in was um, chapter 8, which is the discharging systems, just because of what was going on with the US EPA and the MPDS permits. Um, most of the other changes were made because the Illinois Department of Public Health revised their code in 2013, so then we had to revise ours in accordance with theirs, and that's why the state, of course, reviewed it and made sure that our changes were in compliance with their code. Okay, are there any questions other than 41 bullet <coughs> points? Mr. One of your points, number um, 3.7, number seven on your list. Okay. You deleted 3.7 relating to residential industrial subdivisions with the minimum lot size 40,000 square feet, etc. And then it refers you in paragraph 3.6 to table two. And I didn't have a table two at the back of my handout here. I know, I'm I sorry. Just, I just kind of wondered what one the, to table. Um, yes. five, for some reason what we had to remove from table two was the perk rates so that for some reason did not get included but we the only thing in table two that got changed the lot size didn't get changed um, just we had to remove perk rates because we can't okay. use perk rates anymore when it goes to the committee can you see that yes. you can get oh, a yeah. copy Sorry. of that table two yeah they're all in the table of contents but for whatever reason they didn't have yeah, I'm sorry about that. I just noticed that one Table four didn't change at all. Table five is in there, and table three I had to I changed one statement in a footnote, but so I'll make sure that they you have all the tables. Good eye. Are there any 
any other questions on this uh, resolution 1428? There being no uh, questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the. Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? <coughs> Resolution 1428 is approved. Well, thank you. I was prepared to go through all 41 items if you wanted me to, but we'll leave that for another. And she has a new battery, so I mean, the microphone could work that long. Including. <laughs> all right. Resolution 1429, approval to, for transfer of funds from fund balance 207 to fund balance 303. Uh, this is moving uh, funds over into uh, capital expenditures and John correct this is uh, this is something that we have done uh, probably at least if not once a year every couple of years we really have no funding stream that goes into this fund 303 capital account so we we use some of the dollars in the fund of, of our operating fund which is number 207 and we're requesting to move some dollars, $100,000 from the 207 to the 303 account, and then we will use those dollars for any capital need, and I, I basically refer to them as anticipated and unanticipated. The anticipated are, you know, if there are some minor renovations or minor upgrades that we need to keep up with here, unanticipated would be a couple of heating units go out, uh, one of our servers in our data room goes out, um, you know, those types of expenses. So we need to be prepared. We've got a balance of $39,000 in that Fund 303. You see it every month. We want to add to it. Hopefully it'll take us at least a year or two. Uh, don't have anything planned major right now, but other than maybe some tree trees. removal. Tree removal. And some dead trees in the parking lots, those types of things. Well, this is a good size agency and they should have some capital budget work with so if there are no questions uh, on this resolution I'll entertain a motion to approve second second mr. Gould all in favor aye, aye. opposed 1429 passes thank you at this point in time uh, Lewis students we're going to go into executive session and the executive session is not open to the public. So you can <coughs> feel free to leave at this time, and we appreciate you coming here. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Second. Dr. Strikes. Second, Mr. Babbage. And we'll have a roll. 